So um, thank you, Martin and Koji. Um, and uh, also thanks to the organizers um, for the opportunity to present here. Um, I am talking today from Sydney in Australia. Uh, and I am actually very happy that I can participate in this workshop without having to wake up at four in the morning. Um, so today I want to present some of the work that I've been involved with as part of um, OCP, um, which is the Open Source Initiative for Perfusion Imaging. Uh, and and um, this work is really about increasing the um, reproducibility of perfusion imaging. So I'll give a brief, brief overview of uh, what we do at OCP and what it is that we are trying to validate and then move on to a, um, uh, a live demonstration of the process. And after the demo, if I have timed this correctly, there should be some time for um, a discussion. Um, I have no conflicts of interest regarding this presentation. So OCP is the Open Science Initiative for Perfusion Imaging. Um, this initiative came about in um, late 2018 uh, from the ISMRM Perfusion Study Group. And at the time, uh, a survey was uh, carried out to identify what the um, 30 group members thought was lacking in um, the uh, current perfusion imaging field. And overwhelmingly, the response indicated that we need to improve the reproducibility of perfusion imaging parameters that we routinely calculate. Uh, and often we do this with in-house bits of code or from open access software packages. And we all know these uh, code are all implemented with small or large differences between them. And there's a large variability in uh, the perfusion measurements that we get. And it's not really our fault, is it? There are several steps in any perfusion imaging pipeline and often we need to make choices uh, one way or another based on the data that we have and the code that we have, which leaves us without any real knowledge of how reliable our measurements are. Uh, so this is also one of the barriers that we face in terms of translation of awesome single center results into actual clinical results. So the mission statement of OCP is really to address this. We want to create open access resources for perfusion imaging. Open access because we not only want people to be able to read through the code and understand what it's doing, but also be able to replicate results. We want to eliminate the practice of duplicate development. Anyone who has ever done any sort of MRI data processing knows how much time we spend on just developing and testing code. Um, and this is a huge waste of time if it's already been done. We want to improve reproducibility of uh, measured parameters. And this is important because at the moment, perfusion uh, parameters have a really bad rep um, of being very imprecise. All of this work will eventually lead us to um, uh, translation of these resources into tools for real world applications. So these are also common goals for a large number of people working in perfusion imaging and OCP was really formed as a, a community driven um, group uh, with a changing leadership team. And so far this model has been working out really well. So there are six aims of OCP. The first aim is to create an inventory of perfusion software packages. And we have different um, task forces made up of members uh, that focus on the different perfusion methods, um, ASL, uh, DCE, and DSC uh, MRI. The inventory is linked to the second aim, which is to create a toolbox uh, that contains the functions, scripts, or pipelines that are needed for perfusion image processing. Um, again, there are different task forces that address each method. The third aim is to create an inventory of the data that's needed to evaluate the software. And these could include um, digital reference objects, the phantoms, uh, as well as clinical and uh, preclinical data. The fourth aim is to develop guidelines on how perfusion image acquisition and analysis should be reported. And there are dedicated task forces for the creation of lexicons uh, for each method, as well as for developing an amendment to the DICOM standard. Uh, aim five is to create a platform for education and dissemination. And this is not active yet. Um, and aim six is to benchmark perfusion imaging parameters. 
Um, this is already ongoing uh, and is carried out through public challenges to identify reproducibility of each parameter. So these challenges, two of them were run this year already, and the results should be out soon. So in today's uh, demo session, I will focus really on the work performed by Task Force 2.3 which is tasked with the creation of a toolbox um, of DCE and DSC image processing code. We collect open source code, we validate the code, and then finally develop a code library for end users. Um, so a public repository has been created to collect the code. Um, this repository has been made available to the perfusion imaging community. I will show the current status of this repository in a little while. And all of the code we have at the moment is contributed freely by various members of the community. We have made a decision to collect Python code for the library simply because it's easier to make open source. Once we have a reasonable number of code contributions for a particular functionality, we need to validate the code. And in order to do that, we first need to identify suitable test data and develop a testing pipeline that is itself reproducible. And as more code is contributed, the testing pipeline should automatically validate the new code and update test results. Um, this is also ongoing and in the demo later, I will go through this process in more detail. The final aim of Task Force 2.3 is to um, develop a standard open source library. And this library will consist of the um, validated code and will be designed around the OCP lexicon for, um, for fusion imaging. The code library is really an ambitious aim. At OCP, we do not wish to tell users what to do or what code to use. Rather, we wish to help users make informed decisions. For now, Task Force 2.3 is validating the various code contributions for DCE MRI processing. So um, here's an example pipeline for DCE MRI um, for the calculation of quantitative perfusion parametric maps. Typically, we acquire T1 weighted images suitable for um, calculation of T1 maps um, prior to contrast agent injection. So this part of the pipeline here. Uh, this is followed by the acquisition of a dynamic series of T1 weighted images. Um, contrast agent is injected after a few baseline images are acquired and the contrast enhancement of tissues is captured through continuous image acquisition. So if you look through a DC data set, you have um, the contrast agent coming in, in each of these images. Subsequently, you see the contrast agent going through the different tissues um, and the contrast, uh, the image contrast changes according to how the uh, agent perfuses to each of those tissues. So in, in terms of processing, what we do is we calculate T1 maps from the pre-contrast um, images. And then we also, uh, convert the T1 weighted dynamic signal to concentrations of the contrast agent in the tissue of interest, as well as in the blood or from a reference region. Um, and this, this is called the arterial input function in uh, DCMRI terms. These data are then fed into a pharmacokinetic model, um, which generates a set of parametric maps. So it is not necessary that all of these steps be carried out. For example, instead of acquiring a T1 map, one may decide to use a literature uh, value uh, for the signal to concentration conversion, or instead of uh, extracting the arterial input function from the acquired data, one may apply a population um, input function. So it is, again, not the aim of OCP to determine the best approach. Um, but we collect code for all possible steps in the pipeline. So at the moment, we have code for most of the basic functionality for DC um, and DSC analysis. And at current count, there are 75 code contributions from 13 authors. Uh, for each functionality, there are more than one contribution. However, there are also many functionalities that uh, for which we require more contributions, especially uh, for the DSC uh, analysis pipeline. And the more contributions there are, the more scientifically valid the test results will be. The code has been collected into a uh, GitHub repository there, um, and it has been curated. So a detailed description of the code is available within the repository in a CSV file. 
that details the author, um, their institution, what the code does and so on. So I'll just pause this slideshow here and, um, and just switch to my browser where I'll show the repository. Um, so this is the um, GitHub page for OCP. Um, and you can see here, there's the um, repository for the code collection. So if we go there, we've organized all of the code here. Uh, there's a there's description of how everything works uh, in these links. And I strongly encourage everyone to just visit visit this page um, and just go through go through um, all of the documents and see how you can contribute. So the CSV files here, where we have a, a collection of all of the code that has been uh, contributed, uh, categorized based on what technique uh, it's for, what what um, step of the pipeline it's for. Um, any other details, um, if it's been published uh, somewhere, um, and uh, details about the authors. So the next aim of the task force is to validate the collected code. And this is perhaps the most complicated part of the work. There's really no gold standard to test the code against. So we cannot identify one implementation as being better than the other. And so we focus mainly on the precision of the measurements. Uh, so if there are multi multiple code contributions for a single functionality, we want to know how reproducible the outputs are across them. We see quite a bit of variety in the implementation. So we would like to know how these differences uh, impact the results. It could also be that a particular implementation performs better than other, but only for a certain range of input and output parameters. And lastly, but very importantly, what test data should we use? So uh, the setup we have is we perform the testing um, using PyTest. We collect test data from uh, the members of OCP and, and also from open science initiatives, such as the OCP challenges. Um, we also use published data and published um, digital reference objects. DROs are great because they allow us to measure accuracy to an extent. Uh, some DROs also simulate data with different levels of noise. So code performance can be tested for non-ideal cases. But there aren't many DROs publicly available. And for some of the steps in the processing pipeline, there just may not be any DROs at all. Um, but we also need clinical data from various body sites to truly test the code. Uh, so we need to test code in conditions of varying SNR, temporal resolution, missing data, motion artifacts, and many more. One aspect of testing is that we want to be able to make the testing process self-sustaining and automated. And at the moment, some of the task force members are working on this with uh, GitHub Actions. I don't know very much about this part of the work, but if anyone's interested, I can put you in touch with the people um, involved. Going back to the DC MRI uh, pipeline, testing has been completed for the code for uh, T1 mapping using variable flip angles. Of course, new code is welcome and needed, and we will be updating test results as contributions keep coming in. Testing is also nearly completed for the signal to um, concentration conversion code and some of the available uh, pharmacokinetic models. So before we uh, go on to look at the code itself, um, I'd like to just uh, give an overview of the structure. So the, the test code is organized like so, uh, and it, this is all part of the code repository on GitHub, and I will go through the live version of it soon. But essentially, the code is organized such that each functionality that we are testing is independent. All of the test data and test files for each functionality are within the corresponding folder. For example, here, the DCE models folder contains test data uh, in, in CSV format. And then we have the test files uh, for each implementation of the uh, functionality. Usually we, we need to have uh, each file starting with 
test underscore and whatever uh, for PyTest to recognize that it's a test file. So common functions that are required for the testing are in a helpers file outside here. Um, and these files are usually just, just fixed. You don't need to change them as you add more tests. So when we do the demo, I'll show what each of these files contain and how the tests are run. So before we go through that, I will explain the functionality that we are testing today. So T1 mapping with variable flip angles is, uh, is one way of acquiring T1 maps. Uh, it uses a model equation that is basically the steady state spoil gradient echo signal uh, as shown here. And the signal varies with flip angle like so. Um, A and T1 are the unknowns here. And the signal data acquired at um, different flip angles uh, is used to fit the model to the data. Uh, so in this example plot, I show data acquired at six um, different flip angles in these blue circles. In an ideal world with no noise in the signal, three data points are sufficient, but it is also important to consider which flip angles to choose because this will affect the quality of the fit. An alternative approach that is uh, probably more commonly used is to linearize the um, spoil gradient equation as shown here. So now the plot is simply a line and given signal data at at least two flip angles, we can calculate T1. For both the nonlinear and the linear fitting, errors in the estimation of T1 often arise from flip angle errors, uh, where during image acquisition, the actual flip angle is not the same as the nominal flip angle. Uh, this is due to inhomogeneities in the B1 field, and so it's a scanner um, source of error. Errors in T1 also increase in the presence of noise, and at very low flip angles, there sometimes is not enough SNR to ensure an accurate fit. The other functionality that we'll be testing today is um, pharmacokinetic modeling using the TOFS and extended TOFS models. For those not familiar with perfusion imaging, the TOFS and extended TOFS models are probably the most used pharmacokinetic models in perfusion imaging of various body sites. These models describe the kinetics of the contrast agent in the tissue in terms of quantitative parameters. So the extended TOFS model, this is the equation for that, it has three independent parameters, so VP, uh, K-trans, and VE. And in the TOFS model, VP is assumed to be negligible. So we only have to fit K-trans and VE. VP is the volume fraction of the plasma compartment in the tissue. VE is the extracellular, extravascular space. Um, and K-trans is the forward transfer rate constant of the contrast agent as it perfuses in the tissue from the plasma space to the interstitial space. CP here is the contrast agent concentration in the plasma compartment, which is derived from the arterial input function that I mentioned earlier. And the C here is the contrast agent concentration in the tissue. So on the right, the plot shows an example time varying um, concentration data with the TOFS model fit in. So the data shown here is from clinical images and it shows the level of noise one can expect from this sort of data. Uh, errors in TOFS and extended TOFS uh, fitting often arise from noisy data uh, and insufficient temporal resolution, and also in some cases from improper model selection. So now that uh, we have gone through the overview, I will switch to the code on my computer and run through the files and the testing process for each of, the, uh, each of these functionalities. All of the code is in Python. And if you don't know Python, it's not a problem. I will talk you through the code anyway. So, okay, so here is the code structure that I mentioned earlier. So this is the test folder in the repository. Uh, it's a bit small, I guess, the font, but I don't know how to zoom in. Um, so like I said, each folder has, uh, each, each folder is assigned to a, a particular functionality that we are testing. So for example, if I go into the T1 mapping folder, there is the data. The data is in um, different CSV files. Um, there is a one, one script that, um, that is used to read in the data. And then the rest of them, they're all the different test files. So if I open up 
one of the test files, you'll see um, that they're all organized in the same way. Um, and, and each test uh, file contains the definitions for each test that we want to run so for each function. Um, and it turns out that uh, code implementations are variable not only in, in, um, in the fitting methods, they're also variable in terms of how each parameter is defined in, uh, in terms of uh, the units that are used for parameters and so on. So when we set up a test file, we often have to prepare the input data to match the function that we're calling. Um, it, it turns out that this is um, a very tedious uh, process um, and then it takes up a large amount of time in this, um, in this testing framework. So uh, what I'm going to do now is um, open up a few of the different implementations that we have for uh, T1 mapping. Um, so so this, this implementation, uh, we read in the data um, and then we define the test file uh, with the reference values that we want. Um, and then we, we run, we prepare the input data, like I said, and then we run the function that, that calculates the uh, fitted, fitted parameters. And then we, we check um, how close they are to the reference. So to do this, what we do is um, we define a tolerance uh, for, for the values. And we do this in, in here, where we assign a tolerance for each of the fitted parameters. So, we use an absolute, that's the eight hole here. We use an absolute tolerance and a relative tolerance level. Now at the moment, I should say that these tolerance levels, they are arbitrary because um, we don't really know um, <laughs> uh, what the tolerance should be for the different parameters. So at the moment they are arbitrary, but once we do this, uh, we can run the test. Um, so, I'm using spider and uh, with PyTest in installed. Um, what we do is um, run unit tests. We set up the um, framework and then we specify the directory from which we want to run the test. So for G1 mapping, I select this one. Okay, so it's, it's now going to run um, all of these tests. And what PyTest tells us is whether a test has passed or failed. What it can also tell us is if we specify that there is uh, one data that is expected to fail, then it can tell us if that has truly failed or not. This is something we, we do by specifying um, the labels in the CSV file that correspond to the data that we expect to fail. For example, here in this, for this test, we have said that this particular label um, is expected to fail. So we can check here in the, um, after the test is, after PyTest has run, if there is, uh, if it, it has truly failed. So I'm looking for that particular test which is, so all this green is good. It means they have all passed, but it doesn't really tell us anything. It's just that they have passed based on the tolerance that we've set. So you can see there are a whole lot of cases. So this one here, uh, so this is, this is the test. That's the test name. Um, and this is the label of the data that we expect um, the model to fail. And so it labels this, PyTest labels this as X failed, which means that you expected this to fail and it has failed. Uh, sometimes it could be that you expect something to fail, but the test may actually pass, in which case it calls it um, X passed. So there are ways to identify and go through uh, uh, how each model implementation works with different data sets. 
And if there are certain implementations that do not work with some data sets, but others do. So this is useful to an extent, uh, but it does not tell us everything that we want to know from the, from the testing. Um, what I'll do now is also go through some of the other um, functionality. So here, okay, let's have a look at the DC um, testing. So this is the DC um, data reading file. Um, so at the moment, we, we only use um, BRO data for um, the DC testing. Um, one thing with DC um, testing is that it's it's not like T1 mapping where you have just one parameter to extract. So, so you, you have multiple parameters that come out of the model. And so you need to specify tolerance um, levels for each of them. And this is this is actually not very easy to do because um, we don't really know what the tolerance should be for uh, for these different parameters. So again, when we run these tests, everything passes. It's very, 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 very rare um, to see a failure. And often a failure only happens when um, there's a bug in the code. Um, so, so this testing is probably not um, great as in it doesn't tell you much about the precision of the results, but it tells you if, if any of the code contributions are obviously wrong um, and then you can pick it up. So again, I'm running the tests for the um, BC uh, modeling uh, just for the TOFs and extended TOFs uh, models. And you'll see that all of the tests will pass. Well, at least they did yesterday. This is a lot slower than the T1 mapping because it's a more complex model equation. So this data that we're using is, um, is from a, a DRO. Uh, and, and the values in the DRO are estimated based on um, uh, brain perfusion, neuroperfusion imaging. Um, so they only occupy a certain range of K-trans, um, V and VP. So when we see the results next, I'll show you what that what the implications of that are. Okay, so here we've, we've picked up one um, test case where it says X failed. So this is the this is the label. So if I go back and check, so we specify one case that is expected to fail. This is one of those. And if I go back to the test results, I'll see that that is one of the test cases that does fail. So um, I'll stop the demo and go back now uh, to show you some of the results. So essentially what we want to do is not just know whether um, something has passed or failed, but rather we want to, um, we want to know Yeah, we want to know um, what the precision is of, of the measurements. So because the pass-fail criteria is entirely dependent on the tolerances, and those are arbitrary anyway. So naturally, all tests will pass. Um, so what we do is instead we uh, plot graphs like this to see, to see what's happening. So for the T1 uh, mapping, uh, for VFA T1 mapping, we tested the code on uh, both um, DRO data as well as some clinical data. Uh, the DRO was again uh, open source. It was from the Kiba collection. And the clinical data was obtained also from uh, published um, data sets. There were um, four implementations of the linear fitting method and three implementations of the nonlinear fitting method. Um, for, in terms of DRO, the ground truth is known. But for clinical data, obviously, there is no ground truth. So we instead um, generated some reference values for the clinical data using independent code written in MATLAB. And so the results of that fit are the reference. Um, so that's the workaround. Uh, in all cases, the tests pass. 
uh, and the tolerances level that we set for this um, data is 5%. So, so we are happy with a 5% absolute and a 5% relative error. Um, so you can see that although we call it T1 mapping, what we're looking at is um, R1 values, which are just basically the reciprocal of uh, T1. So the DROs uh, have a much bigger range of R1 values that we can see. And we see that the accuracy and precision of our measurements go down. So this, you can see this, this the only difference between these measurements is the code. Everything else is the same. And already there is um, a loss of precision. Um, with, with the really large uh, R1 values or even just really extreme R1 values, uh, it is always difficult to, um, to fit um, accurately because the Ernst angle, which is the angle at which the spoiled radiant function reaches its maximum, will, will be outside the range of flip angles that are acquired. So uh, it is, uh, that's why it's important to also look at clinical data. And you can see here for the clinical uh, data, the R1 range is more realistic. Um, and we see that the fitted R1 values are nearly identical, especially in the nonlinear fit and expect, except for one linear fitting method that, that gave different results. So um, looking at the results for the extended TOX modeling, we used again DRO data from literature. Um, the DRO provides the ground truth parameter values um, and the corresponding T1 weighted signal. So to convert from signal to concentration, we used open source code uh, published elsewhere. So here we are looking at the um, errors in estimated K-trans, VE and VP uh, for five different implementations of the extended TOS model. So as we have seen, all the tests pass uh, and clearly the tolerances are really high. It is too large for this test. But this is okay to start because in the initial round of testing, we, we want to just identify the bugs. Um, and in subsequent rounds, we can uh, um, make the tolerance iteratively narrower. Um, and, and this could become another aspect of the code library eventually. For example, if a user requires extremely precise parameter estimates, they might pick an implementation that suits that purpose. Clearly, we also require more test data to examine differences in model implementations uh, across a bigger range of parameter values. So in the DRO that we have used, K-trans is between 0.04 and 0.8 per minute. This is, uh, this is pretty narrow um, because in other clinical data, we often see K-trans values up to a one per minute. Um, similarly with volume fractions, plasma compartments can be much, much larger in other tissues, um, especially in cancerous tumors. So we need, we need more data. We need, uh, we need more um, testing with, uh, with a bigger range of data. So what's next? We, we will continue to collect code for all steps of the um, pipeline. Uh, we especially need code for BSC processing pipeline. And if anyone has any code they'd be willing to share, please get in touch. Um, for code validation, we still have to complete testing the entire pipeline. Um, extended TOFs and TOFs are only two, um, two models. Um, and there are several more models that need to be tested. Some models are very specialized for a particular tissue, tissue type, for example, and these require specialized test data as well. Test data is hard to come by, and it may be that um, we simply have to simulate our own. However, as we have seen from the results, clinical test data is very important. And again, if you, if you have any data that you can share, please um, get in touch. If there are any concerns about data security, please remember that the test data that we use is in CSV format. So where all of the signal data for a single voxel is in each line. So there isn't any identifiable information at all. Um, finally, we need to automate this whole process um, right from creating the CSV files, which takes a large amount of time to setting up the test files and running the tests and reporting the results. I'd like to acknowledge that most of the work that I have presented today was carried out by a whole lot of other people. Um, as you can see, we are a very diverse group from different time zones. So I, I, am, I don't think many of 
uh, the task force members are here today. We definitely need more people to join in, and I will be especially happy to see more people from the Asia Pacific region. Um, you can join the task force, um, visit the OCP website, find another task force maybe that appeals better to you, but um, there are many ways to contribute. So uh, I think we have some time to um, have a discussion on this topic. And I've, I've put up a few discussion points to get us started, but please feel free to raise any topic. Um, there are also the links to the GitHub repository here. Uh, if anyone wants to have a look at the code, um, if you'd like to engage in any offline discussion or have any questions or suggestions for me, uh, or you would like to join OCP, please um, feel free to email me or visit the OCP website. Cool. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Um, so yeah, if people have questions, uh, uh, please feel free to either unmute yourself or uh, put them in the chat. Uh, I guess one thing that I wondered about and maybe haven't fully understood, but um, your test data, you, you just have different data sets and you compare them to an expected value. You don't do things like, or maybe I guess it's a question and a suggestion mixed. Um, mm -hmm. Adding different levels of noise multiple times and calculating the variability or the noise sensitivity of different methods. Yeah, we do add noise at different levels with the DRO um, data. Uh, but we could we we should probably repeat those experiments. So it's only one one time that the noise is added to create the test data, but. Yeah, yeah. So I think you want to do that multiple random. times. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, that's not a question that somebody was leaving. Um, um, may I ask? Yep. Uh, so one thing I uh, have a concern about uh, the CMR analysis is that we don't know the ground truth what's happening. So what you are doing, what we are doing with this framework is just uh, is this model that the uh, the real data follows my model or not? I mean, if in reality the the, the actual uh, pharmacokinetic uh, time course does mm -hmm. not follow the model, it it means that the model is wrong. But, That's right. Uh, yes. All we can do is that uh, how robust is my model is going to be using my let's say fund uh, of data with added noise. So how uh, could we solve that? So how could we tackle that sort of problem? Which model we should choose or what, what the real image looks like? Yes, um, I think that, that that should be part of the educational um, uh, uh, group. Um, there, there should be guidelines on how to select a model uh, based on the data that you have. For example, um, I showed um, the extended TOFs and the TOFs models, and often there is um, there is confusion on which one to use, <laughs> um, and and uh, you know it, it it always depends not only on the body or the tissue type that you are uh, looking at, it can also depend very much on on the data acquisition parameters that you had. So if if we do not have sufficient say temporal resolution, then even if the tissue type lends itself to an extended TOFs model, we, we just cannot measure the plasma compartment, right? So it, it's, it's, a, it's less about the software in that case. It's more about selecting the appropriate model for the data that you have. Um, yes, and that, that is part of the, uh, part of the uh, initiative in, in a way, but perhaps not, not all of it, because I don't think OCP can actually um, and actually you know standardize everything because there's such variability in image acquisition that um, yeah. But I think there are a lot of other groups that that do um, perform this. They they do make these efforts. So if if we look at the Kiba um, uh, uh, Kiba website, they have. Um, they have um, guidelines on how, how to acquire data for DCMRI for different body sites, you know, at what, what resolutions and what, what sort of different um, acquisition parameters you have to use. Um, so so th those efforts are there. Um, 
but it's I think beyond the scope of OCP. Oh, I think we have a question from. Um, okay, um, just think, thinking about the tolerance, if the test tolerance is changed, should the tolerance for the optimize also be changed? It's in the chart. Uh, not really, because the tolerance for the optimizer is mainly about finding the uh, finding the point of convergence, right? The tolerance for the test it's it's really just about the parameter how how much error are we willing to accept, um, and so that that's more of a scientific uh, issue. Uh, it may be that. Um, if, if we want, if we are happy with a 10% error in K-trans, then um, if, if, and if we are using K-trans to um, test a clinical situation where you're looking for change uh, after a treatment or something like that, then, then you, then, then it's up to us to, to decide whether we are happy with a 10% error. So if the change in K-trans is around 15% as a consequence of treatment, and we know that error itself is 10%, are we happy to, to accept K-trans as the biomarker of that response? So, so that sort of thing is, um, I think, um, the issue in determining the tolerance. Uh, just for the purpose of testing the code, the tolerance, um, it, it, it's very variable depending on the application. So we can't really decide what the tolerance must be. Um. Oh, you you can just give up. Just this is just a no. Yeah. So if you have a regarding this point. Sorry, Koji, I just missed that. Can you repeat that? Oh, so sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, so okay. So yeah, the, yeah. The the I hope you can answer. Okay. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, ultimately, we want to stratify the like something. The, the like patient outcome and do the data warehouse the database contains such sort of information to uh, so whatever the model is the ultimate goal is if that model was fine for to predict the patient outcome that model is good and if the externalization gives yeah. a nice outcome that would be good and could we do that sort of stuff using this framework yeah so um so eventually the code library will contain um, plots like the one I showed. So, um, so like these, yeah. and um, what these plots will show is where each implementation stands um, in terms of um, accuracy or precision. So if, if, um, if a user requires a certain degree of accuracy and precision, they might, and they know what range of parameters they're looking at, they will be able to make a choice on which implementation to use in their pipeline. Uh, I'm, I'm saying if the, those each data have some outcomes, good, uh, good outcome, bad outcomes, and we, uh, we wanna uh, know how good that model is, uh, can stratify those two groups. That well, would uh, be if, you're, <laughs> yeah. if you're saying clinical outcome, then right, uh, right. no. <laughs> mm, I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The that, outcome, the good. outcome is really about the precision here, but it, it has nothing to do with clinical outcome, is there? Because um, in a clinical setting, you're looking at something that's it's very much well ahead of this step. Mm. 